As time goes by, I realize people are just curious. Uh, why she's seeking? Something is new, like unique. The eyes will automatically will go there. So that I realized that. And then I told my parents, you know, it's okay, let them just let them see me. Because of my mindset and I told my parents, they let go. You're humans. Mm-hmm. It's something unique. We kind of like, what is that? <laughs> there are four big men pushing me dogs, holding me, thinking I'm possessed. Yeah. So, and he spit on my face like three times. I was like, ew, he's so disgusting. <laughs> and from that day on, I told my mom, if you ever bring me to this kind of places, I swear to God, I'll run away from house. Okay. I'm, my family, my family did went to that path, but because I was saying that's not the path, so they kind of listened to me. I see. Uh, I am Lisa. I am 27 years old, and I'm part-time teacher now. I'm a part-time writer. <laughs> Hi Nisha, thank you for visiting and doing this interview with us. We are so honored to have you here today. Can you please uh, tell our audience about yourself? Uh, I am Nisha. I, I was graduated uh, in University of Malaya. I was doing my master's in English language studies and I'm part-time teacher now. And a part-time writer. <laughs> Oh, you're a part-time teacher and a part-time writer, right? Yeah. I think maybe audience, they will have a question so they can see your, the way you move. So maybe a little background of uh, what you are facing right now. I'm diagnosed with dystonia. I know epilepsy was. Dystonia is involuntary muscle movement. So you can see I can move. I'm moving here and there. This usually happens when I'm talking to someone. When I'm teaching. When I'm normal, you know, it will not be triggered. But if I'm talking to someone, it's usually... It's that. Other than this one, how does it affect your life? Your uh, I think not, not, uh, not. Like, I love to paint, but I cannot paint normally. I have to bend my body in a different way. So, usually, you know, lie down on the floor and paint. Very painful, actually. I'm teaching, driving, I can't drive because, yeah, I'm sick of how to drive, right? Just not because you mentioned uh, when you talk, and then it starts trigger trigger yeah. you to, to have more of these yeah. uh, movements. So, it means that if you just stay still then without doing nothing it will it be calmer it yeah it's more calmer uh-huh. i still shake but it will not be that obvious yeah so that's why my mom uh, she don't let me to talk to people in public but you know i am not like my mom i'll go a while i was like if i can let the body shake i'll talk to people <laughs> i don't i don't listen to my mom they say who listen to mom's advice you know oh uh, you know i'll tell you tell the truth true. <laughs> Before uh, I, I read about your interview, actually I had never heard about dystonia. I, I heard about epilepsy because I read that it took uh, quite some years to have you finally diagnosed with that. So before that, how was the pro- process? Yeah, because uh, okay, it was in Malaysia, it's very rare to have dystonia. We are Asians, we will not usually have In the US, in UK, they have a foundation for dystonia, research. But in Malaysia, we are not yet there. And I tried to find in Malaysia and I went to Instagram. Facebook, I try to ask is there anyone that who have dystonia in Malaysia because I wanted a support group. I don't know how to deal because I was very young at that time. I was 17. I only find one person in Malaysia and he is older than me. He, he's not same age as me, he's much older than me. I see. Is he also in KL or he's in other states? He's in KL but his dystonia is much not severe like mine. Mine is generalized. He's a is focal dystonia. What is focal dystonia? It's just a part dystonia. Uh, they sector in the body. But for me, the entire body. But it gradually progressed like this, is it? Yes. I learned that it started. you started to have symptoms at a very young age. Yeah, and six years old, my left arm started to shake. We, my parents went to a lot of hospitals, but they couldn't diagnose me at that time. Because at that time, I was very new with this kind of condition. You know, we have to go again. So we went to another hospital. My parents thought I was scared. I was having an anxiety or something whenever I talk to people or something. So that kind of, it was a hard, hard child. It was very hard child because uh, my parents thought I am scared and they sent me to counseling to overcome my fear. I'm like, but I'm sick. I didn't know what's wrong going on. My parents didn't know. So I'm going to imagine the teachers. I mean, like, how would teachers normally react to y'all? They're like, don't be scared, don't be scared. I'm here, but I'm still going to be shaking the head, you know? Like, don't worry, don't get embarrassed. They think I get very embarrassed when I stand up and answer. Yeah, in school, because <laughs> teachers also don't know that time. I mean, even my parents don't know, so how can I tell teachers? So I'm fine with that. But it was difficult as a teenager because I was having this mental uh, thing going on. I was thinking, am I okay? What's wrong with me? Why am I shaking? Like, I will go to the bathroom and I just watch me. Why am I shaking when there's no one? There's something wrong with me, you know? 
is is there a time that you feel like you are missing a lot <clears throat> like compared to your peers yeah because at that time when i was child i don't really join in children i don't because i'm scared i mean i'm scared that they will be scared to see me because there was one time uh, one of the parents kind of told the child don't talk to that girl she kind of shaking a lot maybe she will spread the virus or something to you i'm like whoa you did not spread it. but that time you know parents are like that so i when i come to this age i make sure that this awareness is there you know if if any children like me now facing this problem i will be their sister or role model yeah no they shouldn't face like me you know like you know parents say to talk to that child i think that's strong yeah true so just 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 uh, like a, a side talk I, i'm 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 grateful that maybe there's nobody around you that think that you are being possessed by by evil spirit yeah thank god that this not my family thank god that's not Because my family in chai i think for chinese we tend to go that way yeah we can still so so do actually my parents did bring me when i was younger they did they did bring me to all this god thing you know that's one i mean i'll tell you this particular incident it's very disgusting i'll tell you <laughs> what happened was he told my mom i can cure your child this bring bring it to me and what he did he drink the water and spit it out on my face what that was so the god screaming is like yeah no that is so the god screaming that oh my god yeah i was like and because i was screaming they thought i am possessed and, and there were four men holding me four men so i'm the only i was i was straight three or something 21 i think there were four big men pushing me dogs holding me thinking i'm possessed yeah so and he spit on my face like three times I was like, "Ew, you know the disgusting." And from that day on, I told Mama, "If you ever bring me to this kind of places, I swear to God, I'll run away from house." Okay, I'm my family. My family did went to that part, but because I was saying that's not the part, mm-hmm. I was saying, "If you do this again, I'll run away from the house." Mm-hmm. You want that, or you want the child? So they kind of listened to me. I see. That is the. <laughs> What is the relation between this dystonia and epilepsy? Does one of them trigger one another? No, actually no. They are both have different triggers. They are both uh, treated differently. The I cannot be in crowd. So that is my one of my triggers. So it will trigger my epilepsy first. And then next is my dystonia. Cuz both of that cannot take in crowd. It's like I'm suffocating or something. I can't breathe properly. So I usually never will go to crowd and my parents, my family knows that. So they don't bring me to any cradle place, yeah. But both are different. I see. I also learned that you you were bedridden twice. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. What what happened back then? It was so so serious. <clears throat> yeah, because of this Tonya, I told you, this Tonya uh, spreads around the body. That time, my muscle spasm was so bad, I twisted my shoulder. I couldn't stand up. I couldn't walk. So that's when I bedridden like, like a like a month, I think. It took me six months to recover fully, yeah, because dystonia will twist your muscles. That was during the body first day, and I couldn't like enjoy it at all because that time it's already the pain was crazy. With your condition, are you allowed to fly? Yeah, I can. So, yeah. will is is flying comfortable to you or or yeah? Because this is like this, right? So I'm fine with that. You're fine with that. Okay, yeah. so fine. it would not restrict. I mean, like <coughs> it's it's comfortable for you to travel on a plane and. Yeah. on a train also yeah a train because they have this kind of cushion seat you can ask for i mean you get just the seats right so i usually i'll just the car the cushion seat seat before you got diagnosed with dystonia there was a long time so actually were there any hard times for your family to deal with your condition also it started in our 17 and our 17 that's when the situation got worst so i couldn't write my spm that exam passed properly Cause I was straight A students, you know, P F R. So I had the straight D seventies and stuff. And then S T M, my parents thought, oh, she will score. But that time, my health was so bad. I got epilepsy in school once mm. when I was when I was sixteen years old. So that's when my parents said like, something is really wrong with her. You should bring her to hospital. So that's the only part that the, they find it hard. Other than that, I was really normal to that. I was having normal childhood. Only when I was seventeen, and then after that it was crazy. After diagnosis was, it was really bad. Not before that. Before that it's fine. So how how actually does the medicine help? Because um, the, for dystonia they put botox in neck to relax the muscle. Like I think one time I get like fifteen yeah. injection in my neck. 
to calm the the muscle down. But they only can put botox in my neck. They couldn't put it in any any part of the body. So that's the problem. When you keep putting botox, the body became immune to it. It doesn't work anymore to me. Yeah. So now my neck having trouble. Even they put botox, it's nothing because my body already warm to it. And the medicine is most of them painkillers. No, it's to sleep. It's relax. I have a lot of medicine actually, but medication only helped me like 10, 15 percent. That's all. It just makes you sleepy and sleep. How many hours do you sleep a day? I sleep eight hours. I need to sleep eight hours. A day. Okay. Uh, we used to interview uh Marcus. He's a young boy, age twenty, like that, and then he has tic tic dis- oh, disorder. Okay. Yeah. So he says he he needs to sleep at five and then seven or five and then chill the other day. Tic is another crazy syndrome. I'm telling you, you can't control that. Also, that's more verbal. Like small, noisy. I have a friend who's saying who who have tics and dystonia. There are other times that you're being made made fun of. I'm sure that there yeah. there were. So how how, yeah. how do you? When I was young, I yeah. kind of like take it to heart. My family is very protective of. They don't, you know. Whenever anybody's sad, we they stay back. They say back. They're like, why are you staring at my child? You know. They'll just ask. But <clears throat> as time goes by, I realize people are just curious. <gasps> why she's sitting? Something is new, like unique. The eyes will automatically will go there. So that I realized that. And then I told my parents, you know, it's okay, let them just let them see me. Because of my mindset and I told my parents they let go. It's okay, like anybody can see my daughter. You're humans. It's something unique. We kind of like what is that? I also see you uh, uh, you're quite active on uh, Instagram or so. Yeah. Hosting about your daily life or so. Do you think that actually with the assistance of social media actually help a lot of raising awareness of to bring people like you with, with some disorder like this to, to step forward and then to be to be vocal about themselves. Yeah. Oh my god, I think social media played incredible role. I think I mean I think that social media I I've, I've not seen. Nobody will recognize even me, you know, shaking or having this difficulty. But because of social media, I think I found a lot of opportunities also. You know, and started to get bigger and bigger and bigger. People start to recognize my talent, my everything and they started to approach me. Come join us, you know, we have this. Like for painting example, I posted a painting and then somebody said, Come, I give you free classes. I'm very, very grateful for whoever that helped me. It's difficult, but can you see this human when they saw something? I wanna hug this girl. I think that's so beautiful. So I think social media is amazing. You will have amazing results. And also good news that uh, we also understand that you, you successfully uh, raised the fund needed for your upcoming surgery in December, right? Yep, yep. So uh, actually, how, how would that surgery help you? They said 50%, not 100%. Like 50% of the shakiness of this this, this wild movement will reduce 50%. I also have the pain reduction. So I'm very happy at least because medication only doing 15%. So if you're 50% in the surgery, I'm more than happy. So I'm like, okay, let's do this. Yeah, and I'm also very, very happy. This is how social media helped me. And how the fundraise, it's, wow. I think without social media, it might take at least five months to raise that money. But because social media is power, we raise it within a few weeks, actually. How do you feel about the future after that? I'm excited. <laughs> what else this body will be doing, you know, because I'm a very active person. I don't sit there, you know, me, but complain about my life, you know. I'm so opposite of that. I'm more active and my mother will have headache because of me. What did you do today? Did you split your ankle? And I was like, yeah. Sometimes at the activities that I do, sometimes I kind of force myself and strain my muscle. And that's very painful. And my mother has to massage me. And that's a headache for her. But because I'm such, such a person, I'm active. So she kind of like, what did you do today? If after the surgery, I think uh, maybe I'll be something, I'll be even doing more work than now. I'm also scared, you know, what we'll be doing. And I don't know. If you see the surgery, they drill in two holes and they put the wire. It's very scary when you watch the surgery. They show me how the surgery will happen. I said, like, oh my God, I can see the brains, you know. Oh. Yeah, it's very scary, but let's give it a try. I also know that one of your plans, your hope is to have your poem because you write in poem. Yeah. So to be published into a book. I mean, like, since when did you started to write poem? I think when I was 21. I, I, I did a tassel, English teaching in that subject. You have to take literature. So, they teach literature. So when I, And they teach you about poems, how to write poems, and all that. And then since then, I started to write. I have like a collection. I think I have more than 100 poems. Can you cite us, read us one of your poems? Yeah. This is your fault? Yeah. Okay, about it. Ah, okay. 
I think this is when I was bedridden. So, okay, mind me because I might shake a lot and I read. So the title of the book <coughs> is The Spark. I mean, that even in the darkest forest, there is always the spark. A small light to guide you and show you the way. One spark is all it takes to see the entire forest, to know that you are not alone and that you are not lost. So when you are feeling lost and you don't know which way to go, remember the spark and believe in yourself. The spark is inside you. It is your hope. It is your courage. It is your strength. So never give up. Never give in. And never lose sight of the spark. Spark, spark, spark. So this is when I was reading. Now I'm back reading. Thank you so much, Tisha. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. We wish you all the best. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>